Good afternoon. This is uh, the afternoon research talk for Tuesday, uh, talk number five, Ecology of Mammals. I'm Roger Powell, and I'm, I'm the moderator. And we'll get started with Kevin McLean as the first speaker who will talk on modeling movement of three neotropical primates using LIDAR-derived measures of forest structure. All right. Thanks for that. Um, let's see. All right. Um, well, I guess I'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for coming back from lunch and uh, choosing this side of the partition. Uh, my name is Kevin McLean. I'm a fourth year doctoral student in the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies at Yale. And I'm going to be talking today about some of my dissertation work, which is largely focused on the ecology of arboreal mammals. Um, but the section that I'm, I'm uh, addressing today is the most movementy part of it, which is looking at the relationship between uh, forest, forest structure as measured by LIDAR and movement behavior of three uh, monkey species in the neotropical forest. So um, just a little overview of where I'll, I'm headed. I will, uh, I'll spare you the sort of long backstory of everything, but I'll, I'll talk about some of the, the main points that kind of motivated my, my, uh, my research questions, and then talk about the methods, specifically some of the unique data that I was able to use in order to do my analyses. Um, I'll talk about uh, some of, some of uh, the, uh, the modeling, uh, modeling methods. I use step selection functions, as well as the results that I've seen um, anyone that has gotten into any modeling realize, knows that it can sort of be endless, so you kind of have to so put, put a stop to it when you, when you feel like it. Um, so, and then if I've got time, I'll talk about some of the next steps that I would like to do and some of the things that I've already got going. Um, so just uh, as, I, as I started getting into the uh, can uh, canopy biology and arboreal habitat uh, literature, which is pretty scant, to be honest, um, uh, there are a few things that, that came up and one of, one of which is the community itself, as well as the habitat, are very distinct, um, distinct and pretty underrepresented in the literature. Um, the, there, uh, the rainforest canopy in, in, in the neotropics is uh, much, more, uh, much more dense than in most other tropical areas. And as a result, the, it has the largest diversity of non-volant, so non-flying, non-gliding mammals in the world. Um, and also that up to 60% of the mammal species in the entire forest use the canopy to some extent. So it's a, it's a really uh, widely used and really significant part of the forest. Um, another thing that, that uh, became evident um, is that forest structure really does matter in terms of determining where animals are likely to go. And, uh, and the most extensive study of this was done by Mariah Hopkins in a paper that came out in 2011. She was able to show that um, Pathways that are used and then reused over time by howler monkeys were affected, the, the locations of these pathways were affected by uh, location of food resources, the topography of the landscape, as well as the structure as measured um, at like different height classes in, uh, in the forest. And this makes, makes intuitive sense if you're going to move through an environment that has limited substrate, you have to move on something that exists, right? So um, the, third, the third thing that came up in, uh, and as I read through, it was that there is this scaling pro problem that we often face in ecology in that there, uh, there are ground-based measurements or sort of localized plot, plot size measurements that we can do by hand. Um, and on the other end of the scale, there are remotely sensed measurements that we can do. All of these get some measure of, of the structure of the forest or the, the cover of the canopy, but you sort of miss quite a bit in the middle. And that middle portion is where a lot of behavior that we care about occurs. So if you try and scale up the, uh, the ground-based measurements or localized measurements, that becomes really infeasible really quickly. If, uh, and if you try and scale down the uh, remotely sensed or sort of larger scale variables, then, then um, you end up losing a lot of resolution. And particularly in the canopy where it's a very vertically structured system, you lose a lot of the, the detail of, of that, the, uh, the, uh, the forest that the animals are actually using uh, to move through the environment. So the solution to that is to use something that can be sensed over a, uh, over a large scale um, and that also gets at the three-dimensional structure, which uh, is why I turn to LIDAR. 
Now, if you're not familiar with LIDAR, it, uh, it, stands, it is, uh, stands for light detection and ranging. It is essentially the laser version of radar. You can think of it that way. A light pulse, in this case uh, from a, an airplane, is, is uh, sent down uh, from, from above. And the rate at which those pulses return sort of gives you a structural idea of, or an idea of what the, the three-dimensional structure of the forest looks like. Now, LIDAR is not by any means a new technology. It's been used even in, eco uh, used in ecology since 70s or 80s. But it has, it has only been uh, until recently that, or uh, re only recently has the, uh, the resolution of LIDAR been strong enough um, uh, to actually get structure in uh, measures of structure in that dense canopy cover of a tropical forest. Um, and this, uh, the LIDAR that I'm using is from the Carnegie Airborne, in, uh, Carnegie Institute. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about that. So with, uh, with the LIDAR, it gives you the opportunity of something, a piece of, a type of data that is, uh, is measured over pretty large, large spatial scales, um, but gives you the resolution to look at three-dimensional structure on the scale at which individual behavior, behavioral decisions are made. So this sort of this opens up a whole a whole bunch of new uh, questions that just we really haven't had access to before in terms of the habitat as well as behavior within the habitat. So looking at heterogeneity of the structure the structure of the forest in general, um, or looking at how uh, how that structure actually influences the routes and movement decisions that animals make. So in order to do this, you kind of you have to go to a place that has all this very specialized data. And one of the best places to do that is a research station that has been collecting lots of data for the better part of a century. So um, I worked uh, on Barrow, Colorado Island, and was able to do that through a lot of uh, generous collaborations with other researchers. Um, I, I uh, uh, collaborated with the Carnegie Institute to get the LIDAR data with Greg, Greg Asner, um, as well as uh, a few other people that I will talk about in a bit um, to get the movement data. So for the, the LIDAR, um, I, the LIDAR in its raw form is just a huge point cloud, massive, massive data, uh, data files, which uh, I was not capable of handling. So um, I got a few pre-processed versions of it um, that were at uh, resolutions that seemed biologically reasonable. Um, the point cloud itself can be broken down into like 10, 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter voxels if you want, but I just couldn't, 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 I couldn't bear to, to do something like that. So um, I, I worked with two different sets, one a single layer of canopy height, which was at a 1.2 meter resolution, um, and from that you get canopy height, obviously, and also calculated distance to gaps in the forest. Um, I also had a set of, of uh, slicer layers, which gave you a one meter slice of the, can the vegetation density from the forest floor all the way up to the top of the canopy. And from there, you could, you could um, parse out the top of the, top of the canopy, the bottom of the canopy, the thickness of the crown, um, the density of vegetation within the crown. So those were the variables that I came up with that seemed biologically relevant. Um, now the movement data came from from uh, several different uh, uh, different researchers. Uh, the, I have uh, data from on capuchin monkeys from uh, from Mag Crowfoot. Um, I have uh, this my spider monkey data from Christina Campbell and how, and howler monkey data from um, from Mariah Hopkins who did that original study. Um, and the the the, uh, the time intervals for each of these species were obviously decided by the researchers themselves, but provided a pretty, uh, a pretty um, um, detailed view at, at, at the uh, movement, movement behavior over time. So I used, uh, because of the resolution of the, the um, uh, movement data, I, was, I decided to use a step selection approach. Um, so starting with the, the raw movement data, I looked at the turning angles and the steps and step lengths, and from, from those distributions, I generated five, uh, five um, available steps for every single use step. And then you can compare the use step to the set of available steps. Um, and overlaid those with the LIDAR variables that I, I had generated, and from there I could start building the models. Um, so to build the models, I looked at and I did a series of univariate uh, uh, analyses to and 
uh, and then built model uh, the multivariate models from uh, from those. Um, in case anyone is interested, I was looking uh, following some of the methods that are outlined by Fortin, Fortin and his group. Um, they have a couple great raster packages that that do a lot of this um, far more simply than building the code yourself. So, um, so yeah, the, in terms of the results that we I started to see, um, like I said, the, you can sort of analyze these things forever. But um, what I'll start with the spider monkey data because it looks the cleanest. Um, and we, what we see here is like is the uh, variables that we expected to have a positive, uh, pos a positive relationship or some, some uh, evidence of selection actually did um, with the spider monkeys. Things like canopy height, um, the thickness of the crown, the density of the crown, um, and distance to gaps all had a, a significant and positive relationship. Um, I, was also, I also tested the accuracy or the performance of the models using a K-fold cross-validation, uh, uh, which allows you to sort of test how well the, the model performs against its own, uh, its own, um, its own uh, folds or data. So um, the the spider monkeys performed best, uh, and and a, and part of that may have to do with the fact that it their range covers quite a bit of the island. Um, uh, one thing I, I didn't mention before is that the spider with spider monkeys, there's only one real social group, so they kind of had have free reign of the entire island. The diversity of structure that they're able to access. Um, is just a lot higher than other other species that may that are a little bit more constrained by social other neighboring social groups. Um, so we do see a pretty uh, reasonably strong correlation um, with the uh, with the movement uh, movement pathways that were taken and uh, and the variables that we expected. It gets a little bit less uh, less uh, clear with the the other species uh, with the Capuchin monkeys, you see the same, same variables that become significant, things like a canopy, the height of the canopy, crown thickness. Um, the sign and the magnitude of those, those variables, it, it may not be as, or is not, not as strong in these cases. And part of that may have to do with the fact that um, the area that the, the animals uh, uh, move, move in is slightly more constrained. So the diversity of, of forest uh, structure um, that, they, that they may encounter is, could be a little bit lower, or it could just be that the uh, forest structure is not the strongest driver um, at, that, at the, the level that we're measuring it. Um, and it, uh, the, uh, the similar, we see a similar story with the howler monkeys, which have an even more constrained, um, constrained um, range. Um, but the, for both the howler monkeys and the, er, and the capuchin monkeys, the uh, the, the um, accuracy is is uh, around like 0.35 uh, or 0.25. Um, this this Spearman's rank correlation is basically zero is it would be random um, or near zero is, is random. Anything up to one would be a 100% correlation. So. What we've seen, what I've seen so far, is one that canopy habitat is, in fact, does, in, in fact, seem to be het uh, heterogeneous across the landscape. When you look at how uh, how the uh, forest canopy would would look from, say, a satellite image, and use some of the s similar methods of uh, of quantifying canopy cover, um, it does look completely homogeneous, as you can see from that top picture. But when you start to look at some of the three, uh, the uh, the measures of canopy structure as uh, as calculated from the lidar. In this case, it's canopy height. But if you take different slices, you can see that there is a lot of uh, a lot of diversity in terms of where where um, these variables are higher or lower um, across the landscape. Um, the uh, the the next thing is that we found is again like the forest structure appears to be to be driving movement behavior particularly with with the uh, spider monkeys but may may not be the exclusive uh, driver of movement behavior and that makes sense we know that that location of food resources are really really important topography is also very important so those are definitely uh, definitely things to look at in future studies um, but at the moment the structure is what what we're able to to pull out of the lidar um, 
the high, uh, this high resolution LIDAR does allow us to sort of solve the scaling issue of looking at, at, at uh, things in enough detail to incorporate individual movement decisions, but uh, expanding that across uh, the landscape scale. And finally, the, the, uh, it's also sort of important to, to note that um, in terms of using this, uh, the, or I guess the, the way that I've, I've sort of constructed the, the study is sort of provides a framework for how we could analyze arboreal habitat use. Um, whether that may include um, additional additional coloring or or uh, looking at more more variables, but this is sort of a starting point of where you could go in terms of analyzing the forest uh, as a habitat or analyzing the canopy as a habitat for species. So the next thing that I've been working on, I actually just came back from from the field. I was I wanted to get a sense of how well some of the models were performing in in uh, in the the forest itself. So I, uh, w I'm using um, traffic, uh, uh, movement detections as a proxy for uh, habitat suitability. I set up a, a network of 90 cameras across the landscape over the course of three, three months. Um, still in the process of, of looking through all of that. But, um, but basically, we set up the cameras across the, the um, distribution of the model results, so from the predicted low uh, suitability to predicted high suitability, and we'll, uh, I'm just looking to see whether any of that uh, correlates with um, whether the traffic patterns actually correlate with um, the model predictions. So um, I guess I will wrap it up with that, and uh, I'd like to thank thank a lot of the uh, the people as well as the funding institutions that have supported the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, that's one thing that I I, I didn't I forgot to mention is that um, so with when in sort of clean, like cleaning up the original movement data, I I took out all of the really really short uh, short for, uh, movements beca because um, uh, and was was really more interested in in longer longer uh, movements. But yeah, dividing things into bursts or something like that. Um, I took yeah I took out took out anything less than ten meters basically I was more more interested in when they were crossing. Right exactly exactly so yeah it was sort of a combination of wanting to get rid of the like feeding time and also getting rid of GPS error. So, Meg.